welcome to Housefield. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, can you start off with telling us a bit about yourself and your background? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks for having us on. Uh, I'm Jeff Wilkinson. Uh, I'm Managing Director over at Wilkinson Construction Consultants. Uh, we're licensed approved inspectors uh, offering alternative to the local authority building control system uh, here in England and Wales. Um, we, uh, I say, offer an alternative to local authorities. Um, and in addition to that, um, we also provide a variety of consultancy services as well. Um, some of your viewers may know me best as the Building Rigs uh, columnist over on Architects Journal as well. So uh, plenty of ways uh, that you can uh, catch up with us and uh, look forward to uh, working with you and the house build team over the coming weeks as we take a uh, fantastic journey uh, through the various parts of the Building Rigs and try and make them a little more accessible uh, to our viewing audience. Sounds great. Um, to get started, do you want to discuss kind of the building regulations, where they apply and when um, they apply to certain projects and what are the limits? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the first things to do, I, we're, we're going to be running a series of these uh, podcast webinar type things uh, just to, to really help people. Uh, but I think the first place to start is with the manual to the building regs. OK, so that's one of the uh, documents that the government provide. And that kind of sets out for you um, when the building regulations apply, when you're going to need permission, uh, how you go about getting that, that consent and a fair degree of the, the basic stuff uh, that you need to know that the regulations cover uh, and what ones of those regulations apply to, to what types of projects. Um, so I think probably the first question that, that most of the uh, people uh, tuning in today will be asking is, uh, what are the building regulations? So the building regulations themselves are often confused with the approved documents. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, the approved documents over the, the coming weeks and the, the future broadcasts. Um, but the regulations themselves are really quite simple bits in, in many ways. So what they tend to do is they tend to talk about very basic standards. So it says things like um, essentially the building won't burn down. OK, it's, that's that's essentially what what the building rigs are actually saying. Uh, and then what you need to then do is to drive into the guidance. And this is where um, the, the house build app and uh, website are really going to help uh, people to understand how you take that guidance and you can use it for your day to day uh, projects themselves. But as I say, the, the regulations themselves set out when you need to have uh, approval, uh, what type of approval that you need and uh, what the various parts of the regs are that you're going to need to comply with. Um, so let's let's take a look at one of those first bits, shall we? Um, and that's what work is is going to be notifiable. Now, a lot of people kind of get confused between planning permission, permitted development and building regs. So one of the first things I think we perhaps need to do is just to explain to people that almost any project is going to need building control approval, whether it needs planning or not. So some really simple things like uh, internal alterations to your, to your property. It might be that you're just putting a roof light into, into your roof. Uh, you could be uh, taking a, a chimney breast down. Uh, th there's a whole series of very small projects, a throw lounge. Now, all of these things are things that wouldn't need planning consent but will need building control approval and it's important that you understand what the regulations are for that particular piece of work and how they apply to the scheme um, we're going to be going over the forthcoming weeks through the various parts we're going to be looking at uh, some of the specific projects and uh, hopefully give you a real insight into uh, how all of this works and uh, how to get the most out of the house build app jeff uh, just in regards to that, is there many exceptions to the requirements for uh, compliance with the building regulations. I know it differs in Ireland slightly. There's some that there's exclusions. And in Ireland, we have an opt-out clause because the cost of complying with building regulations and getting sign-up can be overly expensive, particularly in one-off houses. Like, is there many exceptions in the UK for uh, not complying with the building regulations? Are the wall kind of structural works comply with relevant to part A through to part M or part Q or R, do they all require regulations or is there key exemptions that people need to know? 
Okay, so I, I think one of the things we perhaps need to, to talk about very quickly is that there are um, there's a series of what we refer to as competent person schemes, which enable uh, on like a small development uh, people to um, self certify their work if they're uh, qualified and competent to do that. Now the scheme that most people are familiar with um, here in England and Wales is the um, requirements around Part P, which is which is electrical work. Okay, so. For example, if, if you're doing some minor electrical work, um, that could be exempt completely for, from the requirements. Um, but if you're doing uh, work, for example, uh, to, to put a whole new circuit in, it's going back to a circuit board, or you're doing some work within what we refer to as a controlled zone. Now, a controlled zone is typically a bathroom or something similar to that um, where you can get water onto the electrics and obviously that's going to be a, a super hazard. So wherever you're doing that kind of work and, and certainly a, like a complete house rewire, you would require building control approval, but you can get someone to self-certify that work on your behalf and submit the the, the paperwork uh, to to the local authority and and perhaps we'll we'll talk more in a moment about the the, the various ways in which you you can get that approval um, but that's not the only one uh, there's uh, schemes for example for uh, wood burning stoves there are schemes for um, gas um, safety uh, installers so there's a series of these um, self-certification schemes that run alongside building control but they are not normally exemptions themselves um, there are a series of uh, works that are exempt and we can talk about those in a moment um, but yes you're, you're quite right to, to point out that some of the really minor stuff um, does have an alternative way that you can get the approval that's but he's not generally uh is not exempt uh it doesn't mean that you don't need to bother it just means that you need to go through one of these alternative schemes okay that's cool it makes it makes perfect sense yeah so the, the the idea is not that they, they're over bureaucratic and say um however you're going about this we want to try and make it and that's you know one of the key parts about the whole reason why we're teaming up with you guys at uh, house build is to try and make the whole of this as simple and easy to follow and as unbureaucratic as, as we possibly can. So um, that's that's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, yeah no, look, at, that's exactly. We're trying to make this more accessible and comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have you, one of the leading lights, in control, <laughs> walking through this and guiding us and guiding people out there and yeah. people watching this, how to digest the building mm -hmm. regulations and say what's the, what you, what you require what you don't require and the majority of cases you do require it mm. and sometimes there is exemptions particularly for what you're saying so, yeah, yeah well, it's great to know that and I suppose now if you want to talk to what where it is where you do require it from like a small scheme to a large scheme and just mm. we give some small examples or you know yeah. kind of talk us through like why you do like not why mm. you need it, what does require it yeah um, absolutely so um, the, the, let's deal with some of those uh, actual exemptions uh, first yeah. of all. So, um, building control uh, approval isn't required, for example, for a conservatory. Now, th there's it's important that you understand what a conservatory is because a conservatory isn't just a glass extension. It isn't uh, you're just going to stick an extension on the back of your property uh, and you don't need to comply. It needs to be it needs to fall within the the category uh, of uh, conservatory, and that that does put certain limitations on it that the expectation is that the roof will be predominantly glazed the walls will be predominantly glazed and the building is separated the conservatory is separated from the main building uh, by like a set of patio doors or an external quality um, thermal elements whether it's doors windows uh, etc so that that gives you a, an exempt conservatory um, some outbuildings, uh, so little summer houses, garden sheds, things like that. Um, if they're under 15 square meters in floor area, five by three, uh, yeah. the most of those are exempt as well. Um, a, a porch, and again, it needs to be, it's not an extension, it's not open, you can't walk through directly from, from one to the other. You have to pass through a door in order to be able to, to get from one bit to the other 
for that to, to maintain its exemption. Um, there are things like uh, temporary buildings, like a marquee or a tent that you're putting up for a, a short period of time, uh, satellite dishes. So, so there are these things that, that are still exempt from uh, building rigs approval. Uh, the best thing that you can do uh, is to either check out on the websites as to whether you're needing approval or not. Um, go and have a look in the manuals of the building rigs. Um, you're going to be able to download uh, a copy of that from from house build um have a look at that it will set out for you uh, all of the uh situations where you've got these exemptions and if you're not quite sure then the best thing to do really is to speak to your relevant local authority inspector and speak to them about whether or not um the works you're proposing are exempt one of the things we're approved inspectors we're an alternative to that um, but we cannot uh, give you an exemption certificate we cannot say that your work is exempt we can tell you how to comply we can get you through the process of compliance but we can't turn around and, and say that you're exempt um, also quite importantly and another key difference between what we do and the local authority do is that we can't step in and give you approval if you've already carried out the work um, so there's, there's a process um, called regularization. So yeah. if having listened to this today, you're suddenly going, oh my God, I've uh, I put new sets of windows in, didn't get building control approval for it. Uh, I didn't use the fencer scheme. I'm going to need to get retrospective approval. There's a process with the local authorities whereby you can put in something called a regularization application, and that allows you to get um, approval for work that, that's already been carried out. Now, as again, as approved inspectors, we can't do that. But let, let me just run through that a, a few more of the, the sort of key differences between approved inspectors and local authorities. So on the assumption that you need to make an application, you can do it essentially in one of three ways. You can use the local authority and use something called a building notice. Now, a building notice is the is the simplest form of making application. Uh, in order to use a building notice, you basically fill in a form and tell the council uh, that you're intending to start work uh, in the next few days, a minimum of, of 48 hours before you, you start the work. What fee with that? Uh, okay. Yes, sorry, there's the there's fees with, with all of these. Uh, it will depend on the type of work that you're uh, using. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that uh, each local authority and each approved inspector will set their own fees. There's not a national fee scale uh, okay. that applies across the whole of the UK. So you will have to enter into a negotiation, if you like, as to uh, understanding what work you're carrying out and what the fee appropriate to that will be. Um, you'll need to fill in the form. You'll need to submit that form to the local authority and say, yes, we're intending to start work now. A building notice can't be used where the building uh, that you're doing the work to falls under the uh, regulatory form fire safety order. Uh, I'll try and simplify uh, that down for people to make it clear as to what on earth does Jeff mean when he, when he says that. Okay, so the regulatory reform fire safety order basically covers anything other than single dwellings. So if you're uh, in a block of flats, for example, um, and you have a common entrance way, you couldn't use a building notice. If you're in a commercial building, offices, shops, railway premises, any of that kind of stuff, you can't use a building notice. So it really is intended only for those smaller scale domestic type projects. Okay. What it means is that you don't have to get architects drawings and details done. But here's a big warning about this. If you're doing that, you are leaving yourself open to um, the situation that you've not got plans approved, you've not got details approved in advance. So what will happen is you'll carry some work out, the inspector will come out and the inspector will go, I'm happy with that. Or I'm not happy with that. And if you haven't got the plans, you haven't got the details in front and agreed in advance of that, you could find yourself pulling down all of the work that you've done and putting it all back again to meet the requirements of the, the inspector. And again, this is where if you are going to go that kind of route, 
having something like house build in front of you is going to be hugely beneficial because you're going to be able to see some of the typical sort of approved details the ways in which you go about doing this in order to make sure that you've got a good idea that when the inspector does turn up that what you're doing is going to get signed off um which you know, uh that all makes perfect sense and like with regards to when they, that happens and in my learned experience as a fire consultant as an engineer mm. like it's a separate system in Ireland but the main reason why people come a local authority or the building and control inspection comes down on them is non-compliance with part b and part m mm. and people have done have come up with their own scheme or design and they haven't been cognizant of part b or part m part b for everyone mm. out there is fire safety and part m is accessibility mm. Oh, that's when you're doing internal layout changes mm -hmm. if if you if you if you don't have a design that complies with them you're likely more than likely to get a building control inspector come up and say take that down mm -hmm. you have to make it good and that costs money mm -hmm. that really costs money it, 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 it can be a lot simpler e e even than that i mean sometimes uh you might think that you're it's something really simple like uh, a through lounge for example and in your head you're going to go oh well i'm going to put in a, a six by four beam uh in there to to span the uh 200 by 100 or 150 by whatever it is in in, in modern metric uh, but you're going to get a beam and you're going to stick it in there um if you haven't had that designed and calculated and checked and approved uh bear in mind that you're running a huge risk that the inspector's going to come in and it either a turn around to you and say you're going to need to justify that or b turn around and say that's going to need to come out so I would never recommend going down the building notice route. For me, you really always want to spend that little bit extra making sure that you get the thing designed properly in the first place, making sure that you're, you're going to get something that's going to get approved because the costs of doing it properly and having that design in the first place are more than offset by the cost of getting it wrong um, yeah. and, and the delays and the costs of, of putting these things right so what i would say is that what you really want to be doing is if you're using the local authority use what's referred to as the full plans route now the full plans route means that you need to submit fully detailed sets of plans to the local authority showing compliance with all of the relevant uh, parts of the the regs all the way through uh, a to s as they they currently are uh, whether it's structure whether it's uh, drainage all of this information needs to be collated and put onto the plans to begin with and then submitted to the council uh, they'll typically take sort of five to eight weeks in order to uh, get those plans checked uh, and back to you um, and then you can if need be you can make amendments to those plans and, and get that kind of benefit that sort of certainty uh, before you actually start putting the spade in the ground um, because that's going to mean that you've got a far better way of doing it. One of the other things about not doing it that way is what is your builder actually priced for if he's not pr priced off a set of detailed plans? Uh, because it may well be that it shows foundations. It, what depth the foundation? Yeah. Uh, and it, if the inspector comes out and there's no details on there and, and the guy starts digging, they haven't considered trees, they haven't considered... Uh, drains or anything on the site um, all of a sudden what you thought might be meter deep might suddenly be 1.8 meters two meters deep well that's double the digging double the material uh, and not surprisingly double the cost um, so in and potentially if they haven't thought about where the drains actually are, haven't checked where the drains are before uh, the work started on site you may start digging down the foundations and discover all of a sudden to your horror that the drain is in the exact line that you thought your foundation was going to be going in on. There's some of the things that we come up with. It's, it's yeah. so you'll be surprised some of the issues that we find going out and, and inspecting these things that that people haven't gone to the effort of of lifting a manhole lid and and actually establishing. Oh, hang on a second. This is where where the drain runs. It might not be a good idea to put my foundation there. It might be an idea either move it that way a bit or yeah. that way a bit, yeah. not where the drain is. Um, yeah. 
So all of that detailed design at the beginning really helps to make sure that the builders price for the right things and that you've got a good degree of certainty that, that what you're going to be doing uh, during the course is going to get signed off. Now, obviously, I can't come on a program like this and not mention the fact there is an alternative to using the, the council <laughs> service. Uh, and, and that's us. Um, yeah, so, promotion is always good. <laughs> absolutely. So there is also the option of using an approved inspector. Now, an approved inspector uh, basically is performing the same function as, as the local authority. Uh, that You're still going to have your plans checked if you send them in. Uh, you're still going to have your sites inspected in much the same way that you would uh, whether you're using the, the council or not. Um, but what we like to pride ourselves on is that we're a little bit more approachable. We can perhaps use language which is a little easier to understand for people, explain things in a better way. And whenever you, uh, you're using our service in particular, what will happen is when we come out, you'll have had a set of plans checked. You'll have a full list of any extra details that we're still expecting. So if we do want a Part P certificate, you'll know at the beginning that we're going to want a Part P certificate. And you'll get that followed up with copies of the inspection reports, photos of the um, things that we've seen on site, identification of any defects. If, if the builder has done something wrong, uh, then obviously we'll notify you, let you know uh, what it is that needs to be rectified and, and give you details of that. So that when you're getting towards those later stages, you, you know with some degree of certainty uh, that the works are going to be signed off. And I think that's that's probably one of the, the, the key things that when you're looking to appoint um, your, your building control, whether it's the local authority, whether it's us or whether it's another approved inspector, that you actually understand what you're going to be getting. Are you going to be getting copies of the site inspection reports? Are you going to be getting all of this information? Um, because these things are not cheap. Um, you wouldn't go out there and, and, and buy a 30 grand car without thinking about uh, doing all your research. You wouldn't expect someone to design the car on the back of a fag packet um, in the weeks leading up to you uh, purchasing the, the thing. Uh, you'd want a fully designed car yeah. Uh, and you want to know exactly what's in that car and exactly what you're going to be getting for your money um, before you hand over any of your money. And on top of that, you'd also want some sort of warranty type thing in place so that you can understand that there's, there's someone's looked at it, they've tested it, they've checked it. Um, and we're not talking about just a 30 grand investment here. In, in many cases, uh, a lot of the uh, projects that you're going to be working on be 30, 40, 50, 100k uh, with prices that um, are, are going up and material costs that are, are going up all of the time. Um, you know, these are really expensive investments. And if you get them wrong in, let's say, for example, the, the insulation isn't put in properly or you've not got the best uh, designed heating system, not only can it cost you now, but it can cost you in the running costs as you continue. So complying with the building regulations really is, is the minimum that you should be looking to do. Really, you want to be going beyond that. And again, that's where things like House Build can show you not only what you need to do as a minimum this this is what will get you through the mot but look at what else you can have as well and that's where you can get real savings yeah and like people need to realize that mm -hmm. it's it, when you the minute you buy it's the minute you sell it so mm -hmm. if you have a better quality product than your neighbor next door you're going to get a better price mm -hmm. and like just in regards to it no we're not we're not going to hold you to any mm -hmm. price mm -hmm. prices for it but for say an improved inspector for uh 2000 square foot building what kind of price range would you be talking about for our building control you, yeah. like, and it all depends on local authorities i know mm -hmm. um but it's um like ballpark for people mm -hmm. out there what is the thing if they're doing a large dwelling themselves mm -hmm. so would you like to divulge yeah. that <laughs> or is that so, so for a, a, a single sort of uh, dwelling house, you're probably looking between one and two thousand pounds kind of uh, fees, a, a, a sort of typical of what uh, most building control bodies will will be looking to uh, charge. But that's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of, of your costs. You will throw away more in waste materials costs yeah. than you will in spending on your building control costs. So again, this is where really, this is where you want to think about where you're getting value. It's not about cost a lot of the time, it's yeah. about the value because you know, if 
if for whatever reason they've not told you that you need to provide these certificates at the end of the project or that you're going to need to be doing this at, at that particular stage then you can add delay to it now if you're borrowed money in order to uh let's say you're on a bridging loan or you're on some form of development finance uh, that's going to be coming at a high interest rate that high interest rate if you're going to default and you're not going to be able to move on to a different product or you're not going to be able to occupy or you're not going to be able to sell your own property at the key date then all of a sudden you're going to be paying another 500 thousand two thousand and it's just wiped out any oh. of the issues that you had about what you're spending on on, on on your compliance side of stuff so think wisely about where you're uh, making those decisions uh, look i know as an engineer um, dealing with projects it's some of the best money you'll ever spend because mm -hmm. your job is to value engineer mm -hmm. you, you have to meet the minimum of the regulations but guide yeah. you're trying to say look this product can do the same as that more expensive product we can make you savings and this is how you can do it better to engineer it so as you save money and like at one or two thousand pounds for a dwelling it is the best money you will ever spend absolutely absolutely um so let's say you've made your application you've gone through the process of of getting your approval you, you're all ready to start um what you then need to do is you then need to notify the inspector that you're going to be commencing the work and what you should have had from them um, either in advance or at that notification stage is what we typically refer to as a stage inspection plan now it's important to, to point out here perhaps that building control isn't a quality assurance process we're not clerk of works we're not going to be on your site every day funnily enough um you'd use up your one to two thousand pounds worth of uh of fees very quickly if we were on on site yeah. all day every day yeah. so what you're actually going to get is a series of, of what we refer to as stage inspections now if, if we talk about a typical house uh, that's likely to be foundations it's likely to be uh, drainage it's likely to be uh, the oversight and damp proofing works it's likely to be at the stage that you uh, start to put your structure in so your beams lintels floors uh, your insulation when you get to, to the walls uh, the roof structure fire protection uh, and then completion and testing stage and then what we refer to uh, as as the final completion handover occupation stage so you're probably going to get something like around six or seven inspections on on a typical sort of single dwelling house now if it's a more complex project you may well end up with more than that um, if you think about the bills time it's probably about one inspection every month for you know six to eight months being a, a typical ish kind of uh, uh, build time on it um, so you're only going to see the inspector coming in having a quick look round, just making some general checks just to make sure uh, things are okay now it may well be that things are not quite as they should be or aren't completely ready um, some inspectors will also offer additional um, like video type calls so that they can the, the bit that you hadn't finished we can see by video or they might say you know the uh, the installation was only 50 percent complete can you send in photos of the installation fully complete um, and i think that's perhaps something that we uh, yeah yeah i yeah, will particularly focused on one of the latest changes to, to the regulations uh, for new build houses is now that you will have to submit a full set of um, photos of all of the insulation junctions so uh, wall to wall floor to wall uh, roof to wall uh, reveals all of that and in addition to that it's not just a photo it's a GPS positioned photo to show that that actually relates back to that site uh, it's time it's dated it clarifies which junction it is so building control are going to be expecting that kind of level of detail now on all of these new build projects and that's just to confirm that you're meeting the thermal bridging requirements so right. you, you're not the heat loss is going through and then you, you, did it require the same on windows with air tightness that to make sure they're sealed right or okay. is it on the junctions of the walls and the, where it meets the external so, 
so in terms of the photographic evidence we would just want the photographic evidence of those junctions okay um, in particular showing the uh, insulation in place um, because there have been builders over the years that haven't necessarily put all of the insulation in <laughs> they should have been uh, yeah they finished finished on a friday next team's come in on a monday whacked the windows in and they may have forgotten to have put that last bit of insulation in so it's important that they they keep those details uh, but in addition to that there will be uh what we refer to as an air pressure test at, at the end of the project which okay. basically does a test on the building overall to ensure that there is not um, too much leakage so all of the ceiling has been done uh, around the junctions uh, whether it's services passing through walls or junction to junction uh, within the wall itself uh, generally speaking the more airtight the building is the better it's going to perform uh, yeah. and the regulations vary slightly depending on uh, how airtight uh, your building is but that's something for us to focus in on as we drive in more detail uh, in one of these future podcasts we don't want to reveal everything yes you, you, you've got to come back we're not giving it all away today yeah perfect um and then with regards to uh sign off at the end do you, to for to occupy the building mm. and when you notify them at the final stage how long does it take how long does it take you before you can occupy the bill and what your sort of completion at the end or your yep. right okay so, yeah very good question that okay so when the work is kind of complete and that is it's a really interesting discussion as to what is complete from from building uh, perspective the fact you haven't got carpets or curtains in for example doesn't mm -hmm. affect whether we can sign it off and, and complete it um so we're not looking at those things but we would expect the kitchen to be and we would expect the uh, sanitary ware to be in place uh, we would expect the electrics to be complete we'd expect to see some form of lighting it may not be the the light fitting that ultimately you're you're gonna uh, end up with but we would expect all of these things uh, to be in place um so we've come out we've done our final inspection uh, we will have notified you in advance of all of these tests so we'll want tests on the drainage we we'll want tests on the ventilation to make sure that's done we'll want the electrical test certificates uh the gas safety tests there's going to be a series of documents that you're going to have to produce and send to us but there is depending on the type of project that you're doing and obviously we're predominantly focusing on uh, domestic work and, and and new house builds um there is a period of time um from the building being effectively complete that you can walk into it and you can occupy to the point at which you can get your final certificate so if you did need to get in slightly earlier there is a period of time from occupation to completion of up to eight weeks um for you to uh, get the the relevant paperwork through and if there is a delay on that for some reason um you can request an extension of time typically up to three months um but that certainly can't include anything that's like life safety so uh, yeah. if you've got a sprinkler system in for example and that's not commissioned and working you couldn't move in and expect a, a three month extension of time on some of those sort of key uh, life safety features. So it is possible to move in before then, but bear in mind that the, the clock is ticking from the moment that you move in uh, through to, to the point that you actually get your completion certificate. If you've got, if you've got yourself organized, you're off and running, you've got all of these in to us, you get us out, it could be as little as 48 hours from the inspection being done we've got all the certificates sent in to us everything that we need um it's quite a quick process to then turn that around but the critical bit is making sure that you get the information to us that we need we will have listed this to you and yeah. so you do know in advance what you need to do so plan that make sure that you've got your electrical test people, your ventilation test people, um, all of these people in doing their tests and commissioning and handing that information over to you. Uh, not least because, again, going, going back to our lovely car analogy, when you move into it, you're going to want the manual that tells you what you've got and how you use it and what's the most efficient way of, of operating this. 
because particularly as we move to more modern systems, uh, air source, heat pumps, things like that, people are not necessarily going to be familiar with how these bits of kit work and how to get the, the maximum out of them. An air source heat pump, for example, works far better if it's effectively running pretty much continuously and just provides a low level of background heat. You don't do what you do with your boiler at the moment, which is come home after uh, work, quickly whack it on, expect it to heat up really quickly uh, and then turn it off again and, and carry on. So it's very different. So it's important that you understand the bits of kit that you're now getting in these uh, new buildings and how best to use them. And as you say there, with these heat pumps, if there's no point having a heat pump working all day if you have the windows open or if you don't have proper air tightness because yep. it means then all the heat's leaking and it, the heat pump is to maintain the heat in the dwelling to a certain level. And if you're letting let the air out or all the heat out, it's working more, it's just costing you more. So you have to get it right. There's a reason behind it and it's not just... <laughs> to, to, to cost people yeah. more. Well, my heat pumps cost me a fortune, but because mm. you have all the windows open, so yeah. like you know, there's reasons behind all of this. Mm. And air filters for mechanical heat recovery mm. need to change every six months. Yep, it's, it's it's part of the product specification. Mm. If it doesn't, then you have poor quality air, and we all yeah. want to live and breathe in with good quality air. Mm. So, yep, that's. Get, get going home and, and being able to breathe, I think, is always one of those basics that we, <laughs> we, we kind of take for granted, don't we? But uh, it's, as it, 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 it's really quite weird because one of the, the major changes that, that were in the regs, and we'll, we'll talk about part F of the regs, which is the one that deals with ventilation. Um, one of the things that we've seen is almost all new houses that were being delivered over the course of the past 10 years have much worse air quality than they're supposed to have and what you particularly see people are they're they're, they're they're lighting those sort of incense candles they're cooking away they're plugging in their um their well-known manufacturing plug-in type um air freshener things yeah. all of these are actually creating more volatiles in our air and because our buildings aren't leaky drafty horrible things anymore um, you're not getting the level of air change in. And if you don't turn on your uh, ventilation fan, if you haven't got the trickle vent in the, the top of your window, if you don't perhaps open your window and just do a bit of purge vent for uh, yeah. 20, 30 minutes, you're, you're going to find that they build up and the, the quality of our air is actually quite shocking uh, yeah. in our in our new buildings. Um, and making sure you get that balance right and making sure uh, that you're not leading to condensation of mould. We all saw uh, the, the horrible story of um, the young lad uh, that, that died a few weeks ago um, yeah. from, from uh, mould and contamination in his, in, in his property. Um, it's important that you understand the ventilation systems and the number of arguments that we get with architects in particular about, but I don't like the idea of having a little trickle vent in the top of my, in my lovely thin window. Yeah, but there's a reason for it. <laughs> because that, oh, sure. that okay. little thin strip prevents all of this horrible uh, mold and condensation so it may not it may not look good but it's <laughs> yeah exactly and that do you know what you're saying with your hand over your documents like for your mot mm. what's something that i'm trying to champion with my clients mm. and dealing with people is that not everyone you get a manual mm. it goes into a cupboard and you never read it and you might then when you start feeling mm. air quality or just something mm. happens the the then you start reading it so like i'm trying to get people and manufacturers mm. see it all now qr code and have mm. a three minute video on mm. youtube or some platform that will yeah, tell absolutely. you what you need to do and you can go back you mm. can scan the product get the look at the manual there online mm. or the installation say look we recommend or even get an alert from the product supplier once it's commissioned that this is a commission on a certain date and like you get a, a text reminder from that manufacturer you need to change filters mm. So yep. like these things, like we're living in a modern world, we shouldn't have to like worry about this stuff. We're inundated with information. Why can't we make things simpler? Like yep. manuals go in the bin. It's like the old brochures that we used to have when we're out trying to market for our business. No one reads them. They're always going in the bin. You might look at a few pictures, but that's it. You know? uh, absolutely. I mean, the technology is there now where the fridge will reorder your milk for you. Um, I'm sure 
that if your supplies are getting low or you're getting to the point where uh, your air filter is is yes. getting to, to, the technology is there it, it can automatically uh reorder from amazon for you and it will just turn up i mean we we have that on our printers at work that as soon as it reaches a certain ink level it will automatically reorder the ink for us so that before the cartridge runs out because there's nothing worse than that you're halfway through that important document you're ready to yeah oh my god i've run out of ink the stores are closed uh Amazon won't deliver until the, the following day, uh, but I need to get it out tonight. But we've already got it there in advance. So the technology is there. And as we move forwards, I think that's something you can see far more of uh, being introduced, whether it's the technology to ensure that um, the lights turn themselves out uh, if there's no one in the room. All, all of this kind of stuff is there. Um, and I'm sure as, as we progress on with the uh, the stuff that you guys are doing on the House Build app, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity to, to link on to those kind of products and just see uh, what kind of efficiencies uh, they can bring to your modern technological house. Well, that's brilliant. And um, I think, like, I'm not sure if you have much more to add, Jeff, but that's all, been all I was going to say. We, we, we've been talking about the process. The other key point is to make sure you keep that all important document. First of all, don't allow the builder to disappear off of site until you've got that document in your hand. Uh, you really want to make sure there's kind of like a defects liability period as well in there so that before you've released all of the money uh, to them, you, you've got uh, that that in place. And Jeff, as uh, approved uh, inspector, do you work closely with a warranties company or is that brought in independently? And do you do yeah. you recommend one or to go and get your defects liability or did you just yeah. go to the insurance broker when someone is doing that work? Okay, so uh, we need to be clear here that a warranty product is a financial product. Okay, so it's, it's an insurance type thing. Uh, so you really need to make sure that you're getting uh, the correct financial advice and that the product whether it's a warranty or an insurance policy or a pc uh, an architect certificate practical completion certificate um, if you're going to be relying on those and um, utilizing those um, that they're the correct one for you what i would say is absolutely 100 percent i would be looking to try and get uh, some form of warranty document in place um, and I wouldn't necessarily rely just on the the builders recommendation for it I would look at the market to see whether what cover are you actually getting um, so what things are included what things are not included um, is it a case that the, the warranty basically says that the builder will come back and and make their their, their best attempts to sort out the issue or will it actually be taken out and replaced? Um, so just bear some of those things yeah. in mind that not all of these policies are actually offering exactly the same thing, whether it's 12 years, 15 years, 10 yeah. years, um, and what's actually covered and what's not covered. Um, but because it's a financial product, I can't make any recommendations yeah. and it's entirely separate uh, to the services that uh, we as approved inspectors uh, provide. Yeah, no, no, that's just to give food for thought for our customers and let them know that they yep. need to look at this as well. But yep. um, listen, I think that's a brilliant first uh, introduction and I'm looking forward to uh, chatting more and having a few more laughs about what's going on in the building world. Absolutely. Uh, let, let's see what we can share over the coming weeks uh, and just keep tuning in because there's going to be lots more of this content uh, and you don't want to miss that bit that's all important for the project that you're working on. So keep tuning in, come back and we'll see you again soon. Cheers.